Hey everyone, welcome to Disciple Dojo for another study Bible review. Before we jump into this one, if you haven't already, go ahead and click like and subscribe. That's a great way to help this channel continue to grow and to help us reach more people, including people with questions about study Bibles. All right, let's get into it. This time we are looking at the New Interpreter's Bible. This is the New Revised Standard Version with the Apocrypha. It was published in 2003 by Abingdon Press. This Bible clocks in at 2,298 pages and there are 19 full color maps in the back. This is the hardback edition and it comes with this dust jacket, which we're gonna get rid of. This is a two column black letter edition. It's available in hardback, leather, leather, ish maybe and soft cover there are no illustrations and no pictures anywhere in this bible it is text only with the exception of the color maps in the back the general editor is walter harrelson and the associate editors are senior smith tribble and vanderkem some notable contributors include eugene boring pete ends joel green donald hagner and Dennis Olson. Now, a lot of the contributors to this are also contributors to the new Oxford Annotated Bible, which we've also reviewed here recently. If you missed that, click here and you can see it. Now, in terms of the Bible itself, the paper is very thin and you can kind of see how wrinkled it is very tissuey like paper and the binding at least in this edition i have is kind of funky it's it wrinkles a lot around the binding and kind of bunches up not exactly sure why that might just be this bible literally or they all may be like that i don't know let me know if you have one now after the table of content and the list of contributors we come to the introduction by walter harrelson and it's a fairly standard introduction it does note a few things that are important to know going into using this bible one is that the notes at the bottom are not annotations so this is not like the oxford bible these are commentary they also note that the contributors do not agree theologically on everything within the notes you will find disagreement and the editors did not see fit to smooth those out, but rather let them stand. After Harrelson's introduction, there's Bruce Metzger's preface to the NRSV, followed by a list of abbreviations, and then a list of excursuses. I always thought the word was excurses, but right there it's spelled excursuses. So all of these uh, little excursus sections throughout the Bible in the notes they're listed here in the canonical order and then there's a list in the alphabetical order as well so you could look up the different excursuses throughout the study notes after that there's a section on the canons of scripture so it gives the jewish canon the roman catholic canon the protestant canon the orthodox canon and then there's a little table that gives the books that the anglican church uses in their apocryphal readings after that we jump right into the old testament and we're at genesis so there's no introduction to the old testament no introduction to the pentateuch at the back of the bible after revelation you come to this section called guides for interpretation the first essay is by walter harrelson it's on the reliability of scripture that's somewhat misleading because the essay is actually about the trustworthiness of the transmission and translations of scripture so it's sounds like somewhat of an apologetic title and whether we can trust the Bible or not, but it's really not. It's do we know that we're reading what was originally written in the text? Then we come to the essay, The Authority of the Bible by Phyllis Tribble. We're going to come back to this one. After that, there's an essay called The Inspiration of Scripture by Robert Noos. Gnus. G-N-U-S-E, am I saying that right? And it's basically an overview of the general views of inspiration that different faith communities have had at different points throughout the history of biblical interpretation. Then there's an article by John Donahue called Guidelines for Reading and Interpretation. And this is a very brief overview. It says it right at the front, a brief overview of interpretation, a, a very, very succinct introduction to the concept of hermeneutics. After that is this essay by Edgar McKnight called Varieties of Readings and Interpretations of the Biblical Text. It's quite a mouthful. What this essay is, is basically a short, but really helpful, really insightful summary of all the different ways to read the Bible. 
Let me rephrase that. Some ways to read the Bible and a lot of ways to misread the Bible. So he discusses things like the traditio historical reading, form critical reading, redactional reading, canonical reading, sociological reading, existential reading, structuralist reading, new critical reading, deconstructionist reading, feminist historical reading, feminist literary reading, and liberation theological reading. So it just kind of gives you a survey of these are how all the different ways in the world people have read the Bible. After that, James Vanderkam has an essay called Culture and Religion Among the Ancient Israelites. It's a little too oversimplified to be of much use other than just a broad introduction. It just wasn't terribly helpful. Then after those seven essays, we have a glossary. These are terms that you might hear in biblical scholarship, but you may not know exactly what they mean. Apocalypticism, anthropomorphism, deuterocanonical, diaspora, polemic, pseudepigrapha. It's a helpful glossary. A lot of the terms that biblical scholars throw around as jargon are covered in that glossary, and that's a good thing. Then there's a section called chronologies, and it's basically a timeline of the Old Testament and the different rulers, a list of events that took place during the Hellenistic Maccabean Roman era, what we would call the intertestamental period, and then a New Testament chronology, events that happened in and around the first century and shortly after. After that, you have the index to the maps and then the color maps themselves. Now, when we come to Genesis, you're going to get standard documentary mid 20th century scholarship, basically. So the author does talk about the sources that have been identified that were put together into the book of Genesis and how we can kind of ferret out those sources based on certain criteria in the text. And it's fairly typical. You get, for instance, when dealing with the flood, there's an excursus on the two stories of the flood where the contributor basically just said, well, these passages are from the J E source and these passages are from the P source. And so what they do, which is standard among a lot of documentary hypothesis approaches to the Pentateuch is they look for any variation within the text and then suggest that, and sometimes just assume that that is evidence of different sources that were edited together. It's a very fashionable approach. It's typical in a a lot of mainline biblical scholarship of the Pentateuch. I'm not a fan of that approach. I think it is dubious. I think it's based upon criteria that are unconvincing, subjective, and unnecessary. And so when reading through Genesis and Exodus in this Bible, it's, it just becomes distracting. Almost every note is about the priestly version and the Yahwist, Eloist version and how they were originally contradictory sources. I can appreciate documentary hypothesis advocates making observations about things in the text, you know, like this seems to suggest X, Y, Z, or this may be evidence of a later redactor or, you know, something like that. But when almost every note or every section is a chance to talk about how the Yahwist perspective and the priestly perspective are just different and that one got it wrong or the other corrected it or something like that, it's just unhelpful because it, it dissects the text into all of these separate strands and then kind of pits them against each other. And so the notes on Genesis, there were some good notes every now and then, but for the most part, it was just all Yahwist, Eloist versus priestly. And I didn't find it very helpful, honestly. Same thing with the notes on Exodus. Uh, the introduction, it's not bad, and it does operate from a later dating of the Exodus, so a 13th century during the time of Ramses II, as opposed to maybe a 15th century back during the time of Tutmosis or one of the other pharaohs, which is fine, but it, it doesn't give the two options, so that's I don't really love that. And, and it makes good literary observations throughout the text. There, there are some helpful notes. There's a good short little note about God hardening Pharaoh's heart and whether that's deterministic or not. And I thought that was it's short. It could have been longer. It could have gotten into the Egyptian background of that concept, which other study Bibles that we've looked at do. It didn't go into that very much, but it was a good note. It also has a really good note on salvation and the sea on page 106. So a brief little excursus about what the imagery of the sea and God triumphing over the sea means in biblical theology. Now, Superhero Seminary's own esteemed Professor Aquaman up here has given a lecture on that topic, which I recommend you check out after this video right here, and I'll put it in the description below. It was good to see 
see it covered in the study note. And then on page 113, there was a good excursus about covenant in the ancient world and how important the concept of covenant is, not just to the Pentateuch, but to the Old Testament and to the Bible as a whole. But just like with Genesis, the Exodus notes still are beholden to kind of a JEP trichotomy. I was going to say dichotomy, but three of them. So, well, they kind of put J and E together. So it is a dichotomy. It was right the first time. I'll show you what I mean. The note in Exodus 2 about Moses' father-in-law, it says Ruel is also named Jethro in Exodus 3, 1, 4, 18, 18, 1, and Numbers 10, 29. He is called Hobab in Numbers 10, 29 and Judges 4, 11. Biblical scholars use this and other subtle details for example, the two names for the mountain, Horeb and Sinai in Exodus 10 through 20, Deuteronomy 33, 2, Judges 5, 5, to determine the literary sources, J-E and P, behind Exodus and the other books of the Pentateuch. And so that's an example of, again, some of the criteria that documentary scholars will use. They'll, they'll look at, oh, this author used the name Elohim. This author uses the name Yahweh. And instead of recognizing that a single author can call God by two different names, they posit these hypothetical sources, of which there's zero evidence, that then take on this whole history of development throughout the centuries. That's why I say the documentary theories are all really built on a house of cards. If you just take one little assumption away, most of the theory crumbles. So you could look at the fact that Jethro is also called Ruel and say, oh, well, this is evidence of two different authors. Or you could realize that one author can call somebody by two names. You know, we've read stuff where John F. Kennedy is also called Jack Kennedy, or Abraham Lincoln is called Honest Abe, or a writer will talk about George W. Bush or W. So just the idea that if you use two different names or two different terms talking about the same thing, that's evidence of different authors at work or different sources. That's what I mean by documentary hypotheses being built upon very shaky subjective criteria. And unfortunately, that's the outlook that the contributors to the Pentateuch, especially Genesis and Exodus, are operating from. Now, when we come to Romans, the book introduction to Romans is really good. It, it covers the needed relevant material for interpreting Romans. The notes are a little hit or miss though. What I mean by that is there's a good whole excursus on the I of Romans 7 and the traditional approaches have been to either read this as Paul speaking of someone who is in Adam, therefore outside of Christ, apart from the Holy Spirit, being a slave to sin in chapter 7, and then in chapter 8, speaking of someone who is in Christ and what it should look like, or the later Augustinian reform view that was popularized by Martin Luther and others during the Reformation, where the I is just Paul talking about his ongoing autobiographical daily struggle with sin that he just can't ever seem to win. And interpreters bounce back and forth between those views, but the notes in here kind of take a weird hybrid view. The excursus on the eye of Romans 7 will say, after listing the different interpretations, a more plausible interpretation is that the intrusive eye refers to Paul's experience as a Christian. Unusual present tense in 14 through 25 appears to represent Paul's mind at the time of writing. So it takes the view that in this section, Paul is writing about his everyday experience. But then the note in 9 through 12 says, verse 9 refers to Adam's innocence in Genesis 1, 26 through 2, 16, before the prohibition against eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But then in verse 14, Paul shifts from the condition produced by Adam and Eve's disobedience to its effect in his life. I am sold into slavery under sin testifies to the enduring reality of sin in the Christian life. So, therefore, 7, 24 through 25, is eloquent testimony to two simultaneous realities in Christian life, the wretchedness of sin and evil and the ecstasy of grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. The introduction of the Spirit in chapter 8 is a triumphant antidote to the lament of chapter 7. So it takes kind of this hybrid approach. It's, it's weird. It recognizes the Adam imagery when Paul's talking about the effects of sin enslaving humanity, but then he kind of shifts into like a Lutheran view of Paul was talking about Adam, but now he's talking about his ongoing battle with sin. Regardless of whether or not I find that approach convincing. And if you want to see why I don't, you can click this video as well. It's still good to see 
at least acknowledging that there is a debate about it. But then when it comes to the discussion of issues involving predestination and election in chapter 9, the note about Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated says, this distinction between love Jacob and hated Esau does not refer to eternal salvation and damnation, but to remnant and ethnic Israel. And then about election, he says God's purpose of election, verse 11, in verses 6 through 29, appears to be limited to the function of Jews and Gentiles within history rather than to eschatological destiny. So what he's saying basically is all the discussion about, you know, election, predestination, none of it has anything to do with salvation. It's all just about how God uses peoples throughout history. And I actually agree with that view, but I don't think it's a fair note because it doesn't even deal with the large number of Christians who disagree and why they disagree, which is weird to see in a Bible published by a publishing house made up of mainline denominations that are reformed like Presbyterian USA and mainline denominations that are Arminian like United Methodist. So even though I agree with what he's saying in this passage, it, it doesn't do justice to the debate, and I think it shortchanges the reader. But then when we come to Romans 11 and the question of who is all Israel and all Israel will be saved, what does that mean? There is a little special note that gives the different views, presents three options, and then says why the contributor to these notes takes option three, which is fine. When I review study Bibles, I don't mind a study Bible coming to a position when there are multiple options. as long long as they fairly present the other options. I prefer them to just present the options and the strengths of each and the critiques of each and let the reader make up their mind. But if you do come to a conclusion, that's fine, as long as you've been fair to the different views. And that note isn't too bad. It's just really short. Romans 9 through 11 is like one of the densest sections of the entire Bible. They needed more discussion. They needed to do a little more justice to all the ways Christians approach that passage. And lastly, when we come to Revelation, it's about a two and a half page introduction. It's good. The notes are okay. They do a decent job of giving the historical background. They lean heavily into the symbolism of Revelation and take something of what we would call the idealist approach in terms of the main interpretive approaches to Revelation. For more on that, you can see this course here at Disciple Dojo where we go into all of them. But I'll give you an example of what I mean. In the excursus on interpreting the near end in Revelation, it says, John expressed his faith in the thought forms of his day, one of which was the apocalyptic hope of the near parousia, return of Christ. History has shown that this form of the Christian hope was mistaken and should not continue to be repeated, just as modern Christians can interpret John's mistaken understanding of the shape of the world without thereby rejecting his message, so also modern Christians can take seriously John's message of hope expressed in the apocalyptic form, which included the near expectation of the end, without continuing to repeat it in his terms. He kind of comes from the position of, John was wrong, basically, about you know the end being near, but we can still pull good stuff from it. What bothers me about that note is that it assumes that the only way to read Revelation, the only way that John wanted Revelation to be read, was depicting the near end of the world. And I think that that's a possible way to read Revelation. It's by no means the only way to read Revelation, and I don't even think it's the best way to read it. I think a strong case can be made that John was using the form of apocalyptic, and the discussions of the end being near speak to the timelessness of Revelation without John being mistaken about it. So, it, it does a little psychoanalyzing of John, which I think goes beyond what the text warrants. And he does it again when we get to the millennium. You know, there's a brief, very dismissive note on the millennium, basically saying interpreters have misread the text, and that's why they've come up with different millennial views. I don't think that's fair to those views. I think historic premillennialism has a long and distinguished pedigree. It's, it's not a view I hold, but I think you can make a decent case for it. And the note just seems really dismissive. But then he also gets back into kind of analyzing what John intended. It, the note on chapter 20 says, the millennium is only for the martyrs, but John expected all faithful Christians to be martyred. Not necessarily. I mean, martyrdom is a big 
image throughout the book of Revelation, but I don't think you can just say, John expected all Christians to be martyred. That's what I don't like about the notes of Revelation, is it oversimplifies. And, and the notes throughout, I mean, that's one of my critiques of this approach, is that you're getting one scholar's commentary on each book of the Bible. And yes, again, like with the New Oxford Bible, while the scholars may come from widely different traditions, and that's nice, you're still only getting one scholar's approach to each book of the Bible. So you're not getting to hear the full voice of Christian interpretation on passages where it's very important to know the difference in Christian interpretations. Let me note a few things, though, that I do like about it. One of the things I do like is it includes the Apocrypha. I think that's helpful in a study Bible, especially one that's ecumenical. I like that it's the New Revised Standard Version. I grew up with that translation. I think it's a good translation. It's not the best, but there's no best translation. There are a bunch of good ones. And the New Revised Standard Version is a good translation overall. One thing I was surprised to see is all of the book introductions to Paul's letters are open to the idea that Paul may have actually written them. Now, this may come as a surprise to those of you that have grown up in fundamentalist evangelical circles, but in mainline critical New Testament circles, it's just taken for granted that Paul didn't write the pastoral epistles, he didn't write Ephesians, you know, that these were written in his name and his authority borrowed and then kind of cobbled together with the actual letters of Paul, and that became what we have today. All of the introductions to the Pauline letters acknowledge that yes, there is debate about his authorship in some of them, but that they also all could have been written by Paul. And if so, then this is the setting that that would have taken place in. I was surprised to see that much more so in this than in the New Oxford or the Harper Collins study Bible. They do a better job of acknowledging the possibility of Pauline authorship. Now they don't allow for the possibility of Peter being the author of First and Second Peter. They do assume that those were written in his name, maybe by some of his followers. Sorry, Peter, you didn't write any of your letters, but Paul, you may have written all of yours. Maybe, maybe not. For a mainline Bible, that's about as good as you're going to get. So what are the cons? I'll give you one that's really nitpicky and then one that is of all importance. The real nitpicky one is one of the things that's distractingly annoying is that they used phonetic spelling for Hebrew names throughout. So all of the hard to pronounce names are kind of spelled out in that phonetic, like you'd see in a dictionary. Maybe that can be helpful the first time you're reading a text, but after a while it gets real annoying. Having every name broken up into its syllables and pronunciation, it's just, it's distracting. It's annoying. And it's unnecessary because here at Disciple Dojo, our most popular video of all time is how to pronounce all those hard to pronounce Bible names. You can click on it right here. It's got more views than all of our other videos combined and it renders such things unnecessary. You're welcome. But in seriousness, the major criticism I have can be encapsulated in a couple of notes that I want to show you. The first note is on page 132. This is in Exodus 32, and it's about Israel at the golden calf and the rebelliousness and the incident where the Levites then went through the camp and put to death the people who were openly and brazenly engaging in idolatry. The special note kind of encapsulates what I feel is a shortcoming, not just of this Bible, but of a lot of of mainline biblical interpretation. These few verses are horrific. Agreed. The writer would have us believe that faithful devotion to God includes the willingness to kill one's own family and all who disagree with the writer's view of reality. That's not what was happening in the text. There's nothing about disagreeing with any writer's view of reality. This is a command in the text. So to smooth it over, to make it more palatable, he says, we must remind ourselves that the writer or editor of Exodus was probably writing during or after the exile. The writer is responding to both the destruction of Judah and to life under a foreign idolatrous power, Babylon or Persia. Not if Moses was the author, not even if it was compiled shortly after Moses, not even if it was pre exilic So to make the text more palatable, they say the author was writing almost a thousand years after the events. And so that's the real stuff that was going on, not any of this stuff about the Exodus and the golden calf and idolatry. So then he says, modern Western readers must struggle with being members of powerful cultures that worship at the idols of the bottom line, national security 
prosperity, sex, physical beauty, consumerism, and other destructive self-indulgent cultural trends. I mean, yeah, that's true, but it was literally a golden calf in this instance. Only in this way can we interpret and use this text without becoming as narrow and violent as the text itself. Jesus never seemed to think that the text was narrow. We don't get any hint that he or any of the New Testament authors had the same problems with the text as this interpreter has. And so the text is judged by a modern Western 21st century ethic instead of being put back into its context, its actual context. And so in this way, the interpreter stands above the text, condemning it and considering it, you know, narrow and the writer's view of reality is what people are being killed for disagreeing with. And it's just a very artificial way of reading the text on our terms rather than reading the text on its own terms. But again, this approach is popular among different mainline preachers and teachers that teach that parts of the Bible are in some way inspired by God and other parts are just from mistaken humans that were at times backwards and unethical and narrow-minded and bigoted and all of the other things that they want to label them as. And so the Bible presents a difficulty for many in various mainline traditions. I mean, it presents difficulties for all of us in all traditions, but one of the difficulties it presents for people in mainline traditions is that the biblical texts at times seem troubling and violent and horrific. So how can the Bible be authoritative in any way if it contains these types of things. That's a conundrum for a number of interpreters. And there are different ways to handle it. But one of the ways to handle it is by completely redefining what the concept of biblical authority means at all. And that's exactly what Phyllis Tribble does in this essay at the back on the authority of the Bible. I said we come back to this one. Let's jump in. After dismissing the concept of the Bible being the Word of God, Tribble goes on to say the authority of the Bible comes then from individual readers and communities of faith. They confer it. Scripture doesn't have any intrinsic authority we give it authority. The reader does. So then Trouble looks at three narratives in scripture involving women, because she is a pretty stringent feminist interpreter of scripture. And so she chooses the narrative of Eve and talks about how Eve intended to safeguard the authority of God's word by adding to what God had told them not to do. And so she concludes, the world's first conversation, mythically speaking, inaugurates the unsettling and unsettled subject of biblical authority. Then she jumps to the narrative in Numbers 12 of Miriam and Aaron rebuking Moses for marrying a Cushite woman. She glosses over that part and talks about how Miriam says, has the Lord not spoken through us also? The us refers to herself and her brother Aaron. For Miriam, the word of God comes not through a single source, but through diverse voices. Her questions are bold. To question the means by which God chooses to speak is to challenge the authority of God. Miriam pays a severe price for the challenge, which if you know the story, God struck Miriam with leprosy. And so then she notes that this narrative reflects political struggles in the wilderness where various parties vie for power. The party supporting Moses wins and proclaims his victory as the word of God. Well, or God did. Yet the victory did not totally succeed. Centuries later, a different word of God emerges. An oracle in the book of Micah renders Miriam equal in leadership with Moses and Aaron. Micah 6.4 like them, she represented God before the people. What the wilderness God denied Miriam, the prophetic God awards her. Different texts within the Bible yield competing views. Both claim to be the word of God. Most surely, the authority of the divine word is subject to human interpretation, even manipulation. So, because there's a passage in Micah which speaks of Miriam being a prophetess, that somehow is a competing voice against this voice. And so the God of the prophets, pro-Miriam, the God of the wilderness, anti-Miriam. It's just such a contrived, artificial, unnecessary reading of the text. It's inventing contradictions that aren't there. You can be a prophet and still be rebuked by God on different occasions. Those two things aren't mutually contradictory. So then she goes on to talk about Hulda and how Hulda basically determined then had the authority to declare Deuteronomy as scripture. And then after this gives what she believes are seven features of authority. And the first one 
Despite the origin of the word authority, which locates power in the authors of the Bible, neither the authors nor the texts hold authority without the consent and assent of readers. The authority is not imposed power, it is legitimated power. It results from a democratizing process. People of faith give to and take meaning from the Bible. Authority then is reader-centered. That could not be more wrong if we take the Bible for what it says. So yes, in the sense that we have to choose to believe or accept the authority of the Bible, okay, yes, we, we all have to make that choice, sure. But that doesn't mean that its authority is therefore centered in the reader. If God actually exists, if he actually is the divine creator, if he actually is the divine lawgiver, then whether or not we accept or assent to his laws is just as irrelevant as if I accept or assent to the speeding ticket that I get when I get pulled over. Then she talks about the Bible having the authority of authentic description, okay? And the authority of the reader's context interacting with the text, all right? Biblical authority embraces the authority of struggle and difference. The authority of struggle and difference undergirds biblical authority, whatever that means. And then she talks about Jesus when Satan quoted scripture at him in the wilderness, and he responded by quoting Deuteronomy. She posits that Jesus was rejecting scripture that Satan was quoting as scripture for him, and therefore showing that we can choose to reject scripture as scripture for us, but doesn't say anything about Satan misusing scripture. It's, it's almost as if she presents Satan as just presenting some biblical authority and Jesus saying, I reject that authority, and then quoting his own scripture of preference. So then the concluding paragraph says, these encounters show Jesus exercising the authority of choice over the contents of the Bible as he appeals to the authority of the Bible to establish his own authority. Judging the sacred words, Jesus chose some as appropriate for his situation and rejected others. He never did that in the text. Jesus doesn't reject any of the scriptures Satan quotes. He quotes other scriptures that show how Satan is misusing the scriptures he's quoting. But nevertheless, Trouble concludes, though resisting definition, the phrase authority of the Bible embraces a cluster of concepts rather than a simple formulation. The concepts themselves open to interpretation, spread among authors, texts, and readers in diverse settings. From ancient to contemporary times then, the subject remains unsettled. Though the prophets of Israel often claimed to speak the word of God, they could not validate its authority, but neither could their critics defeat that authority. As for Jesus, confronting the question, he exposed his critics and refused to answer. This is word salad. That's what this is. This essay is just nonsensical. So not just this essay by Trouble, the whole approach that majority of the contributors in this Bible take is just unhelpful, honestly, for discipleship. So would I recommend the New Interpreter's Study Bible? No, no, I really wouldn't. I think there are some good interpreters involved in it. You know, I think of like Joel Green or Dennis Olson in particular, and, and there are some others. So, so there is some good stuff. You can occasionally find a diamond in the rough, but there's a lot of rough, honestly. The approach is too much of a hermeneutic of suspicion. There's an uncomfortableness with the text that I think goes a little beyond what we should be uncomfortable with as faithful disciples who wrestle with scripture and and you know there there is a sense that scripture should unsettle us it should make us uncomfortable we should wrestle with it but at the end of the day we should do so as if we are wrestling with god himself and his word mediated to us rather than wrestling with ancient authors and their outdated modes of thought and that is the overall ethos that permeates this work so, no, I do not recommend this. I would put this as maybe a hair's breadth above the HarperCollins Study Bible, maybe, and maybe below the New Oxford Annotated Bible, and definitely below the CEB Study Bible in, in terms of mainline study Bibles. But no, it's, it's very disappointing. I, I would like to see Abingdon completely revise and re-release a New Interpreter Study Bible that did justice to the very landscape of biblical theology and yet also remained faithful to Scripture as inspired Scripture. And 
I don't think they do. So no, I wouldn't recommend it. Before I go though, I do want to mention some resources because a lot of the people that are going to read this study Bible are not ever exposed to any other views. And when they come to the, as Tribble calls them, texts of terror, the hard sayings of the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, they just kind of take this almost Marcionite approach of like, ah, that's all Old Testament stuff. That's the, the God of the wilderness, the God of those Israelites, the primitive unenlightened God. And, and we, we worship Jesus. He's the true God and the true light. And just an approach that pits Jesus against the Hebrew Bible, which is incredibly unhelpful. So for people who do struggle with that, I want to recommend this book in particular, Christopher Wright's Old Testament Ethics for the People of God. This is one of, if not the best books I've ever read on how to approach and interpret the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, as a Christian, as someone who does believe that Jesus is the incarnation of the God of Israel who gave those scriptures to his people. So what do we do with those passages when we come to it? What do we do with the laws? What do we do with the obscure passages? What do we do with the violent passages? What do we do with the arcane, hard to understand passages? I definitely recommend this. In fact, this is going to be a giveaway in an upcoming Disciple Dojo video, so stay tuned for that. And for those after reading the essay in the back by Tribble on the authority of the Bible who come away just more confused than when they started, I want to recommend two resources in particular that I think do a fantastic job discussing that particular issue. The first is N.T. Wright's book, The Last Word. This, I believe, has been republished with a different title, Beyond the Bible Wars to a New Understanding of the Authority of Scripture. It's a small book, easily readable, but fantastic. And then for a fuller treatment on the issue of scripture as God's word, and what does that mean? And, and what do we do with that? I want to recommend this book by a friend of mine, Ben Witherington III, his book, The Living Word of God, Rethinking a Theology of the Bible. This is one of the best books you will ever read on wrestling with what is the Bible? Is it inspired? If so, how? How does it speak a word for them and a word for us? All those questions that the essays in here do, I think, a terrible job of dealing with. Witherington and Wright do a fantastic job of dealing with. So I would recommend these, especially if you use this Bible. Supplement it with these. Okay, that's all for this review. Those are my thoughts as always. They're completely subjective. They're entirely my own. I'm not paid in any way to endorse or to criticize any of the Bibles that I review. I'm just giving you my honest opinion as a Bible teacher. So if you've used this Bible, share your thoughts. Tell me what you think. I know some people really like it. I know it's required reading, particularly at Methodist seminaries. My criticism of this Bible is not a reflection on the broader work of any of the people involved with it. It's solely based on this work in particular. So thanks for watching. Be sure to share your comments in the comment section below. I'd love to hear them and stay tuned for another Disciple Dojo Study Bible Review.